Welcome everyone. Today, as I mentioned, we have Michael Hahn. Um, Michael is a, a Dili Sound graduate of Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and obtained his PhD at Columbia University and is currently an associate research scientist at Columbia. Um, Michael is an expert in uh, solid physics, observation, and also plasma physics, and he's also working on experiments. And today, uh, Michael will tell us why the solar corona is so hot. Um, okay, Michael, take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me here to give the talk. I'm going to talk about alpine wave damping and heating in the solar corona. And, uh, and my focus is going to be, I'd like to tell you a little bit about a few of the current problems that we're working on related to this. Um, before I get started, I should acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, at, at Columbia, um, my, my longtime colleague Daniel and uh, my group members, I had uh, two postdocs who contributed to this project, uh, Dusita worked on some of the atomic physics experiments that I'll mention a little bit about, and Shayak was working on our plasma physics experiments, and uh, Stefan and Grima are uh, the current postdocs in my group. Um, Mabuba is a uh, theorist who I've been working with on uh, collaboration about looking at density fluctuations in the corona and their influence on alpine waves. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, Enrico and Elka have been collaborating on some of our observations. We do our plasma experiments with the group at UCLA and our atomic physics experiments with the group at Livermore. And uh, also thanks to NASA, DOE, and NSF for supporting us. So you are, I suppose, all familiar with the coronal heating problem, but the uh, basic idea, the, the photosphere of the sun, when you go outside and look at the sun, you see the photosphere, it is 6,000 degrees. The corona above it is a million degrees, and the question is, how does the corona get to be a million degrees? Why is it so hot? What is the non-thermal heating mechanism that brings energy from the photosphere into the corona? There are several major structures of the corona. There's uh, the quiet sun, which are the looping magnetic fields, the quiescent loops of magnetic fields. And then there are these coronal holes, which are the areas where the magnetic field stretches far off into interplanetary space. Those are the source of the fast solar wind. And there are also these active regions above the sunspots. And the work that I'm going to talk about is most relevant to the quiet sun and, and the coronal holes. The active regions probably require additional processes uh, to input energy. The basic idea of coronal heating is that everyone agrees that the energy source is the turbulent fluid motion in the outer convection zone. So there's mechanical energy in this fluid motion. And what this motion does is it jostles magnetic field lines around, and this transfers energy to the corona. One way it does that is by you can uh, rearrange the magnetic field lines into stress configurations where they reconnect, releasing the energy stored in the fields. Or the uh, these motions in the photosphere can wiggle the magnetic field lines and excite waves that travel up into the corona, uh, carrying energy with them. I'm going to focus on wave heating. Um, waves we know are found throughout the corona. In particular, I'm going to talk about alphane waves, which are wave where the magnetic field and the plasma are moving together. Uh, and these alphane waves, if they are damped, then they can heat the plasma. So a problem has been to show whether or not they're damped close enough to the sun. Uh, if you just think about the effect of collisions, viscosity, and resistivity on the waves, they would get quite far away from the sun before, before damping, and so they wouldn't be an efficient heating mechanism. They would just carry the energy out into interplanetary space. Um, so they need to be damped close to the sun, below about two solar radii. And then downward heat conduction will fill the corona with heat and create a sharp transition region. Uh, one of our major results has been to look at the amplitudes of these waves and show that they are in fact damped pretty close to the sun. So this, these measurements were made by looking at spectra of the sun and looking at the widths of the spectral lines. So the widths of the lines are broadened by the Doppler motions of the waves. So we can measure the wave amplitude. So this is the, this is the non-thermal velocity. This is essentially the wave amplitude as a function of distance. And uh, the colored points here are our data, and then the, the solid curve is our, our average. So these are some different spectral lines. We measure the, the line shapes uh, and infer these amplitudes. If the waves are not damped, then uh, as, since density is decreasing above the sun, the amplitude needs to increase in order that the waves carry the same amount of energy. And it turns out that uh, the dependence should be like alpine wave amplitude goes like density to the minus a quarter. So this, this dashed curve here 
is what you expect for energy conserving waves. And we see that the amplitudes uh, fall off of that curve somewhere between 1.1 and 1.2 solar radii. Uh, so we can estimate the energy they carry, and there's enough to heat the corona, and they're damped close to the sun. Uh, other people have, have also been looking at this, and uh, their, their observations support ours, so I, I think that people believe this now. So that leads to some, uh, some of the coronal heating problems that I want to talk about today, which are, um, we're interested in knowing what causes the wave damping. Uh, I want to talk about reflection and turbulence and the possible influence of density fluctuations in the corona on promoting reflections and turbulence. Phase mixing, another wave damping mechanism. Phase mixing depends on the density structure of the corona, which we don't understand very well. So I'll talk about some atomic data to improve our knowledge of that. Uh, and then there are some properties of the waves that we don't know very well either, the perpendicular wave number or the exact alphanic wave mode. So I will talk about some ways in the future where we will try to measure what those are. So let me start with uh, looking at reflection and turbulence and the influence of density fluctuations. There are density fluctuations in the corona. Part of them might come from uh, acoustic waves, compressive waves, and part of it might just come from things that are erupting and going into the corona. So we would like to quantify these density fluctuations and then uh, put them into a model in order to understand what is their influence on on promoting uh, alphane tur turbulence in the corona. We looked at observations from SWAP. Uh, SWAP is on the, probe, the Belgian satellite Probe 2, um, and it is an imager of the sun in 193 angstroms. So uh, it looks at the extreme ultraviolet, and you see the corona here. And the nice thing about this imager is it has a very large field of view. This, the, the corners here go out to about two solar radii. Um, so it, it does, of course, it's not just make images. It, it, it takes these images every 30 seconds or so, and so we get a movie. So we looked at 48 hours of data. And so in every pixel of, uh, um, of this image, there is a time series for the intensity versus time. Um, and I'm going to focus on this region looking below this corona hole along the, the central meridian. This is, happens to be in an interplume region, which is a slightly less dense region of the corona hole. Um, the, the circles on this plot, the inner boundary represents the boundary within we're, which we're able to do our analysis, and the outer boundary here is uh, I'll describe it in a minute. Uh, we use this to quantify the uncertainties uh, or, or the, the noise from the detector. So we take these time series of intensities from all these pixels, and we, uh, these intensities have fluctuations that depend on several things. The total um, RMS intensity fluctuation that we measure depends on the real fluctuations in the corona. This is what we want to measure. If we can measure the intensity fluctuations, we can infer the density fluctuations. But the measured fluctuations also include uh, fluctuations due to accounting statistics, detector noise, and uh, real fluctuations from the solar disk. Uh, these are changes in the solar disk, brightenings and such, that um, become reflected in the corona by the point spread function of the instrument. So we needed to account for all these different kinds of noise. Um, the Counting statistics we can do because we measure the average intensity and take the square root of the number of photons, and so we can subtract this off. To get the detector noise and the stray light noise, we use the corners of those images. So we assume that in those corners, there's no real emission, and all of the fluctuations in the corners are due to some kind of noise, and then we can subtract that off from the rest of our uh, data. And so the result is that we measure the intensity uh, fluctuations, and then from that we can get the density fluctuations. Now, the corona is an optically thin, collisionally excited plasma, and so the intensity depends on the density squared. So there's one factor of density from the number of electrons, and one factor of density from the number of ions. Uh, so that means that the relative density fluctuation, delta n over n, is half of the relative intensity fluctuation. So we take that, we find the intensity fluctuation, and then we just divide by two. Uh, and this is, so this is the density fluctuation versus height. Um, and we can see that the density fluctuations were quite large, like 10 or 20% density fluctuations um, up at uh, 1.3 solar radii. We couldn't go larger than this because that, that's where the noise was dominating everything. Uh, even here, the error bars are large, but I think the trend is uh, pretty good. Um, there's two curves. There's a black and a red curve because we you know, when you're measuring a fluctuation, you have to pick what is the fluctuation relative to. So just to control for systematics, we, we looked at fluctuations relative to the previous 20 minutes of data, which we consider a running difference, 
and then com compare it to the average of the whole data set uh, just to see what difference it makes. And uh, there's some minor differences close to the sun, but uh, the basic trend is the same. So the story here is density fluctuations are increasing as you go away from the sun. And they seem to really start turning on between 1.1 and 1.2 solar radii, which is the same reason, region where we saw our alkane waves were starting to be damped. And so this makes us wonder, maybe these two things are related to one another. There is a couple of ways in which these can be related. One is, is uh, particularly interesting in, in that the alkane waves may be directly making density fluctuations. So there is a parametric instability of alkane waves in which the, uh, the pump alkane wave, the, the outward going alkane wave, couples to a density fluctuation in the plasma. Uh, and generates a two daughter alkane waves, one that propagates outward and one that propagates inward. Um, so it's a, a nonlinear three way interaction. Uh, Shoda et al. Um, in this, this MHD model, they predicted the uh, um, density fluctuation amplitude um, due to parametric instability of alkane waves. So here, this, they're on a logarithmic scale, and I was showing a linear scale, but the, the height range we're talking about is right in here. Uh, and you can see that the uh, a 10 or 20% density fluctuation is consistent with um, their predictions, depending on the value of this parameter, lambda naught. Uh, lambda naught here is the uh, thing in turbulence, you would call this the perpendicular correlation length. I think if, if you're thinking of a wave, this is the perpendicular wavelength of the wave. Um, and so you can, you can see this perpendicular wavelength of the wave is basically the size of the antenna. Um, I'll show when I show the, some experimental results later, you can see it clearly. Uh, but this, this quantity is uncertain to at least four orders of magnitude, which is why they considered four orders of magnitude of the value of this parameter. And uh, probably it's even more uncertain than that, some people would say. Um, so this is something that we would like to measure um, this lambda naught. Uh, but anyway, parametric instability could be causing these density fluctuations. Even if the density fluctuations aren't there due to parametric instability, we still expect them to, to influence the alkane waves. Alkane waves are expected to be reflected from these density fluctuations. So you mentioned these, these density fluctuations creating a, a kind of a corrugated plasma, and the alkane waves are running into this. And those density fluctuations create a change in the refractive index of the plasma, which should cause reflection of the alkane waves. Um, and then the counterpropagating alkane waves should generate turbulence. This is a model um, that I've been working on with uh, Mabua's as Gary Targi's model, and uh, what we have been doing is collaborating to put observationally motivated density fluctuations into the model and see what their influence is on the uh, alkane wave turbulent heating rate. On the left is a smooth model, so this is a model with no density fluctuations, just a scale height change in the magnetic field and the density. Uh, the dashed curve here, this is heating rate versus distance, and the dashed curve is the heating rate required by the background atmosphere in this model. The solid curve, so you, you set up some background atmosphere and then you flow alkane waves through it and see what to, how much turbulence um, generates heating. Uh, so the, the solid curve is how much heating can be generated by the alkane waves in the, in the model. Uh, and so it's, it's not enough in the smooth model. But if you put in density fluctuations at the level of, that we see in the observations, now here the uh, blue curve is what's required by the, the atmosphere and the uh, black curve is what is provided by the waves and now there's enough energy in the alkane waves, enough reflection um, to, to cause the heating. Uh, so there, there's always enough energy in the outward going waves but you have to reflect them efficiently enough to uh, create this turbulent heating rate. Uh, so these density so we, fluctuations- we should think about the alkane waves bouncing off of the turbulence? The, off the density fluctuations. The, the, yeah, the idea is the alkane waves are bouncing off these density fluctuations, and then it's the outward going and backward propagating alkane waves that, that's yeah, that, to the turbulent gas. Right. So that's what's happening. Okay. That, that, that's, that's one idea about what, gen, what um, damps waves. Another is uh, phase mixing, and this is something we're doing some experiments um, to look at. So let me explain what this is. The solar magnetic field is organized into flux tubes. So if you look at the photosphere of the sun, there are these convection cells, and the convection pushes the magnetic field to the edge of the convection cells. Here's a magnetogram. These uh, solid lines are showing the edges of the supergranules, which are the convection cells. 
And the gray scale is showing where the magnetic field is concentrated, white being positive and black being negative. Uh, so this, this forms the magnetic network. Um, if you look at this from the side, what it looks like is in the photosphere, all the magnetic fields are, are concentrated in these small flux elements. As you go up into the atmosphere, the magnetic pressure dominates over the fluid pressure and the, these flux tubes expand, and so they're, they're bumping up against one another in the uh, corona. So now, since transport is fast along the magnetic field and slow going across the magnetic field, these things can have different temperatures, densities, and uh, magnetic field strength, so they can have different alkane speeds. The alkane speed is the phase speed of the wave, so the phase speed of the wave is varying in the cross field direction. kind of a cartoon of what it might look like in the corona. I think that the, the person who drew this had in mind in the, in the interplanetary space, but you still kind of have this, this picture of all these little cells from these different uh, magnetic flux tubes or magnetic funnels in the corona all bumping up against one another, and you have these alkane waves flowing through that. The idea that this can lead to, to phase mixing of the wave. What phase mixing does is it generates shorter perpendicular wavelengths. So, the alkane speed is the magnetic field strength divided by the square root of the density. Imagine we have a cylindrical plasma, and we're um, flowing alkane waves through this cylindrical plasma. And we, we have a plasma that is higher density in the middle and lower density at the edges. So yeah, you put in a plain alkane wave, and the edges are going to go faster than the middle because the alkane speed is faster at the edges. So these plane waves are going to become increasingly distorted as they propagate. Uh, so the alkane waves on neighboring field lines become out of phase. Uh, and this generates to uh, smaller perpendicular length scales, higher perpendicular wave numbers. So if you imagine taking a cut across the plasma here and looking at the magnetic field along that cut. Close to the, uh, close to the antenna, you would just have one peak. Further away, you, you get maybe two peaks in the magnetic field. Further away still, you have many little peaks in the magnetic field going across. So these, this is what we mean by higher k -perp. Um Higher perpendicular wave numbers lead to more rapid damping of the waves. They have a, a larger parallel electric field that couples them to uh, particles more readily. Uh, so they, they damp more efficiently due to collisions and land air damping. Does it, does it account to scatter it all the way to highest k per for the to even on the kinetic scale, or you're looking for slow dissipation of intermediate k per It, I don't think it needs to get all the way down to um, like a gyro radius to, to start increasing the damping rate of the waves because you're you're changing the nature of the alkane waves from a, a pure MHD, you know, infinite perpendicular wavelength wave to one where you're thinking about kinetic theory anyway, and so you're you're getting that. Um, so you can start having Lando damping. Normally, for the long long wavelength alkane waves, we don't think about Lando damping in the corona as being important, but if you start making larger k perps, that can Become more efficient. Right, it's just that if I look at your like plot when you plot the amplitude of the waves versus distance, it looks like the dissipation kicks in very compactly. So I would naively imagine that this is where the waves become kinetic and when the sort of dramatic dissipation starts. So I was just thinking. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. So it could it could be. I think this this would lead to a, a damping that goes like something like e to the minus distance cubed over some length scale, which could be something where it, where it does seem like it turns on very rapidly like that, you're right. Maybe that's what's going on. Or in, in the reflection point of view, it, it could be that's the point where they get reflected, so it, we don't really know, but yeah. Anyway, so. So we wanted to look at phase mixing in the laboratory. Well, we want to measure the rate at which the, the, um, these perpendicular wavelengths are generated and see whether it increases the damping in the laboratory. Um, just to understand the basic properties of alkane waves and study this in a systematic way. So we did experiments at uh, the large plasma device. It's a 20 meter long cylindrical device. There's many, the, the yellow and purple um, things are the Magnetic field coils, so you can vary the magnetic field in um, versatile ways. Here we just used a constant magnetic field. And there's two cathodes, one on the left and one on the right. And the one on the right side was a lab six cathode, um, which makes a denser plasma than the barium oxide cathode on the right side. And it's a smaller cathode, so we could make 
a plasma that has a um, sort of a, a general background plasma and then a denser core, and so there's a gradient in the radial direction in this plasma. We have an antenna in the plasma at one side of the device, which we use to generate the alphane waves, and then we put some probes at different distances away to measure the alphane waves as they propagate away from the antenna in this inhomogeneous plasma. Uh, these probes are circles of wire, and you, um, so the time-varying magnetic field makes a voltage in them, and we can move them throughout the plasma. We, we pulse the experiment many times, it's very reproducible, and you build up a, a plane um, uh, of measurement of the magnetic field. I'll show you one right now. This is the uh, magnetic field in the plane of the device. These are, these are the wave magnetic field vectors. Um, so this is through in a, in a cross section of the device, and uh, I'll play the movie, and you can see this is the Alphane wave See the uh, this is the alphane wave. Um, it's, a, it's a torsional shear alphane wave. And close to the antenna has this nice, uh, basically cylindrically symmetric form. As it propagates away from the antenna, so at the furthest distance of the probe, the furthest distance probe, you can see the, uh, the, the wave has gotten all messed up. Like there's, there's lots of different uh, current channels in there, and uh, the, the generation of perpendicular wavelengths, shorter perpendicular wavelengths, is, is obvious here. Um, so we do see we do see that phase mixing is happening, and we can do look at this a little more quantitatively. So this is the evolution of the k perp spectrum. So this is the wave power spectrum versus k perp for uh, no gradient is the gradient zero, some intermediate gradients, and then our largest gradient here is just gradient three. So near the antenna. All of the waves have the same um, power spectrum as a function of k perp because they, they all come from the same antenna. As you get further away from the antenna, the power spectrum um, spreads out. The energy goes to higher k perps, which is what uh, phase mixing is supposed to do. And does that actually lead to increased wave damping? We see that it does. So this is the uh, wave energy versus distance. And when there is a uniform plasma, the energy in the waves decreases a little bit always because there, there's some collisions in this plasma. Um, but when there is a inhomogeneous plasma with phase mixing happening, the, um, the decrease is much larger. Uh, so, so the basic story holds up, and what we are doing is we want to quantify this in terms of what is the initial perpendicular wavelength number of the waves we launch, uh, what is the size of the gradient, and we'll be able to scale this to other situations and see how it applies. So this phase mixing depends on the transverse density structure of the corona, and we expect the corona to have um, have transverse gradients in the density because it, it starts in these um, small fields in the photosphere. But we we would like to actually measure what is what does that look like in the corona? But that's a very difficult measurement because it's an optically thin plasma, and we're integrating along the line of sight. The best way that you could hope to uh, um, to quantify that is by measuring the emission measure differential in temperature and density, which is this mu of temperature and density. So mu represents the distribution of material along the line of sight um, in terms of its temperature and density. The way you measure this is we measure a bunch of different spectral lines with different atomic properties. And we integrate that, that the intensity from each spectral line is an integral along the line of sight of First of all, it depends on mu, the properties of the plasma, and it also depends on this contribution function g. g uh, incorporates all of the atomic data that you need to know in order to interpret the spectrum. Uh, ionization and recombination rates, collision rates, radiative transition rates, and all of these things. We know g pretty well as a function of temperature, but it is very uncertain as a function of density, and this is what actually prevents us from, you, you can, make some inferences about the differential emission measure as a function of density, but it, they're very uncertain, and you, you can't actually measure mu and, and solve this inverse problem and find it, because g is too uncertain. Um, 
show you an, an example of this. This is from a paper by uh, Peter Young, and uh, so this is a, uh, an active region, and this white line is showing the slit of a spectrometer across this active region. Um, we measure the density, you, you measure a density using a spectroscopic density diagnostic, which is a ratio of two lines from the same element. So the idea is that, by, by, and the same ion. Um, by doing, by you taking such a ratio, you remove the temperature dependence, since the temperature dependence depends mostly on the ionization state. Um, so he's measured the density as a function of, um, this is just a pixel number along this slit, based on an iron 12 and an iron 13 diagnostic. Iron 12 and iron 13 are formed at very similar temperatures. They should be looking at the same plasma. They should give you the same density. Um, but we find, but I found that uh, these densities were quite different. In, fact, in some cases, they're a factor of 10 different. So that's a factor of 10 uncertainty in densities um, in our atomic data. So that is um, kind of bad. So we've been trying to do My chemical. Uh, yes. question was, um, what's the base of that logarithm? Is that base 10? The base? Yeah. This is a base 10 logarithm. Okay, yeah, log ten, base 10 log density. So um, yeah, 10 to the 9 per cubic centimeter is a typical coronal density in, in active regions or other uh, denser. Uh, so we have been doing atomic physics experiments in order to calibrate these uh, um, these density diagnostics. And, uh, so we've been using the electron beam ion trap at Lawrence Livermore. This is a basically it has a cylindrical geometry. There's an electron beam running down the axis of the trap, and there's also an axial magnetic field. Together, the um, axial electric field and uh, magnetic field help to confine the ions in the radial direction. And then there are two biased electrodes which confine ions in the axial direction. Um, we put ions into the trap, electron ion collisions occur within the beam, and then it, it emits spectra, which we can measure with spectrometers um, positioned outside the trap. And so from those spectrometers, we can control the density inside the trap by mainly by varying the beam current. Uh, and so we can obtain um, empirical uh, calibrations for these intensity ratios as a function of density. The points here are our results for um, some different uh, experimental parameters. Beam energy shouldn't matter, but we, we you know, always check systematics. And uh, the curves here are flexible atomic code um, calculations for what these uh, intensity ratios should be as a function of density. And in some cases, the, the theory does OK. Uh, and in other cases, we're off by a bit. Um, so we are working on um, trying to modify these atomic calculations and see what needs to happen in order to better match the experiments, and in doing so, hopefully improve uh, the contribution function knowledge and uh, and be able to do a better job of interpreting spectra. Uh, one aspect of this that is kind of interesting is that uh, EBIT spectra reflect the average density experienced by the ions along their path. And the, the ion orbits are much larger than the electron beam. And so they only spend a little bit of time in the beam. So one thing that we're working on is also interpreting the, uh, um, the densities that we get out of the trap, because we really need to diagnose the uh, spatial distribution of the ions, or the, the energy, which is equivalent to the energy distribution, because it's um, an electrostatic trap. Um, and so we, I am uh, working on a model of uh, calculating these ion trajectories for a large number of ions, uh, and then comparing to the measurements and iteratively trying to back out the ion energy distribution. And then from that, we can get a more accurate measurement of what is the density actually in the trap. There are also some uncertainties that uh, depend on the detailed properties of the waves um, that I want to do. And so this is uh, pointing the waves towards some future observational work. So, talked about the perpendicular wave number, it came up in two contexts. One is, what is this um, rate of uh, phase mixing, or parametric instability, uh, and also in the phase mixing rate. The phase mixing rate should depend on what is the initial perpendicular wave number of the waves, and how does it compare to the perpendicular gradient scale length. In the experiment, the, this length scale is obvious. This is the perpendicular wave length. Okay, that, that's rough. It's, you, you actually need to do some kind of a Fourier vessel series and and there's a spectrum of wavelengths, but okay, it's 20 centimeters in the experiment. But we have no idea what it is in the sun. This is the thing that was uncertain by orders of magnitude in, uh, in Shota's model. 
Um, so we would like to, to measure this further the other way around the design. Another issue that is sort of similar in terms of it, it's something that is just not, a, not spatially resolved in the sun is we, we don't know what is the exact form of the wave modes. There's two kind of wave modes that solar physicists call alphane modes. There's the kink mode, which is really a fast mode, where the um, flux tube shifts side to side. And there's the torsional alphane wave, which looks a bit more like the one in the experiment, where you have a um, twisting of the magnetic fields within, a, within the same magnetic flux surface. Um, you can't distinguish these through measurements of the line width. Um, and both modes are probably present in the corona. There are some indications of that. If you look at images of the corona, if you look at movies, uh, you can see the kink modes. So imagine you take a line across an image of the corona. Here's the Joplin corona. And take every um, take this line at a, several different times in the movie and stack them up to make a time distance plot, and it will look something like this. So here's the position along this line, and the y-axis here is time, and so you can see the motions of things that are wiggling back and forth. So these are, are kink modes. Uh, so we know there are kink modes. It's very difficult to quantify exactly how many because, due to the spatial resolution, you only see the ones that are large enough to cross a couple of pixels. So maybe there are more. We can also tell that there are probably torsional waves. Um, if you look in the in the transition region and the chromosphere, you can see twisting structures. Uh, this is a, from a paper where they looked at the line profile of a magnesium two line in the chromosphere. Um, so you take the intensity on the blue side and subtract the intensity on the red side, and you can tell whether you're seeing red shifts or blue shifts. And so here's an observation. This is looking down onto the solar disk, um, so you're seeing the chromosphere, and there's a lot of red stuff next to blue stuff, which implies that there's something moving towards you and something right next to it moving away, which implies a twisting structure. And these kind of twisting motions uh, are the sort of thing that would lead to torsional alphane waves in the uh, corona. But again, we don't have a good quantification of how much, um, and this affects their, their damping. It also affects um, estimates of how much energy they carry, because the the distribution of energy um, in the transverse direction depends on the wave mode. Our plan is to get measurements of these things using uh, DKIST observations. The DKIST is a new four meter solar telescope, telescope dedicated to uh, solar physics. Um, it's a, a major observatory, billions of dollars, uh, and it's, it's going to be the next big thing in solar physics. And uh, um, it has uh, several instruments that are designed for high spatial resolution and high time resolution. Uh, so for example, there is the, the DL NERSP instrument, Diffraction Limited Near Infrared polar, Spectral Polarimetry, so it does polarimetry in addition to spectra. Um, this, this instrument is, uh, um, takes a two finds two-dimensional spectra, so it uses uh, um, an, an array of fiber optics to, to, take the, to take each pixel and turn it into a slit so that you can get the spectrum from it. Um, so we will have 0.03 arc second spe spatial resolution, which is large compared to the, the images I've shown before are one arc second spatial resolution. Um, so this would be almost 100 times better, and uh, cadences of six seconds. So this is, uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't even really need six seconds. The waves probably have frequencies of a few minutes. Um, so we will have enough time resolution to, uh, to uh, measure the waves, and enough spatial resolution to look at the um, transverse profiles across the wave. So if you want to measure, for example, the um, perpendicular wavelength, we would want to look in the direction across where we see the oscillation and look at the coherence of the wave in that direction, and we will be able to do that. Um, so I think that this is going to help us to better understand the properties of the waves in the corona and make uh, better comparisons with theory and uh, relate our experiments to, to the sun in a better way. So to summarize, uh, observations support models of coronal heating by alphane wave damping. I think that understanding the observed rapid damping and the heating of the corona uh, remains a problem that requires collaboration between observation, laboratory, and theory. Uh, and I think that uh, DKIST is going to provide us with novel high cadence, high resolution observations that are gonna uh, provide important constraints on this problem. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Um, questions for Michael. Uh, so 
in this uh, phase mixing experiment. Uh, how we you probably want to get your mic for people on the. Uh, in the phase mixing ex experiment, how collision collision all the plasma loads? Um, I think there's about one of the phase. I have a, a backup slide somewhere. Here I am. Oh, I, I didn't put the collisionality on it. Okay, I think the the ratio of the collision rate to the wave frequency is about um, is about one. Uh, the next question I was I was going to ask uh, whether you can uh, nail down the dissipation mechanism in the experiment. Uh, in reality, you know, you would expect the competition probably between the connection and blend out I think, because you were also seeing like strong current channels in the transverse plane. So if uh, if it would be collision less, the blend out damping and the reconnection would compete probably. But uh, in the experiment, it's probably just dissipation in this current channels or something else. We think we understand that the uh, um, that the damping in the experiment is in the case where you where you don't have the gradient, we can model the um, the damping in the experiment very well just based on collisions. Mm -hmm. um, you can take the uh, dispersion relation for the waves in kinetic theory, and we know the um, form of waves excited by the antenna, and you can just propagate that through the plasma, and it matches. Um, the measurements in terms of the, the damping rate due to collisions exactly. Um, so so when there's no phase mixing, it's definitely that that, that's, that zero gradient case where you saw the damping in the experiment, that is that is definitely due to collisions. Um, in the case of what is it that causes the additional damping when you put the gradient in, we haven't we haven't tried to nail down what the exact mechanism is. We know that generating higher perpendicular wave numbers increases the damping rate, but beyond that, we haven't studied it yet. Okay. Uh, Mordecai. So let me follow up that question with a similar one. Um, so I hear, you know, from out of the field, I hear the claims from people promoting reconnection that there's enough energy there. I hear your groups and others uh, claims that there's enough energy in the alphane waves. Are they in fact the same order of magnitude? Just both mechanisms are competing, are actually contributing uh, substantially? Or is that, do you have any perspective on that question? I think there, the, the part of the problem with coronal heating is that there are a lot of things that provide a lot of energy to the corona. So it, it's almost not, it's not a problem of having some way to do it. It's we have too many ways to do it and trying to figure out which one is actually happening. Uh, in terms of whether if you have alphane waves or, or something like nano flares where you're thinking of reconnections, there's the idea yeah. that these might really be the same thing, that alphane wave turbulence, the dissipation might be mm. through the formation of current sheets, which that makes sense. sounds a lot like nano flares. Um, and so that that's, it, it could be we're talking about the same thing in a different way. Like there's these, this, the original Parker nanoflare model was about loops and, and you inter entwine the magnetic fields, but people sometimes take a broader view of what nanoflare means and, and now they often use it to mean anything that causes an impulsive heating. So if you're willing to make nanoflares mean anything that causes impulsive heating, I think it could be alphane wave turbulence. Well, and Parker really himself, Parker, Parker himself, of course, showed that uh, very generally, magnetic turbulence does end up in current sheets. And so in that sense, yes. Is that something you can address in the lab? We have not succeeded in, so we have not, my group has not tried to make turbulence in the lab, but there are other groups who are trying to make alphane wave turbulence in, in LAPD and in other places. In order to get the reflected waves in LAPD, they, we're trying to generate, to, to see naturally what happens by bouncing the waves off of a gradient or in an inhomogeneous platform. In some way, they, they kind of cheat to make the alpha wave turbulence by launching waves from two antennas towards each other. And they, they start to see nonlinear effects, but they haven't quite gotten into a regime where they see turbulence in the laboratory. But that is, uh, there's a lot of interest in that, and they're working on it. Very cool. Thanks. Maybe a quick follow-up question. Like, uh, 
your experiment, as you correctly mentioned, shows like a dissipation in a more or less uniform background uh, from observations. Could you pin down sort of the level of strength of turbulence at that point where the abrupt dissipation happens? <coughs> Quantify the level of turbulence where that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know of a way to do it. You could, you could say we're going to look at the non-thermal broadening of the lines, which is like the, the turbulent broadening. But we've already said maybe the turbulent broadening is the wave, so we could be. It could be. How would you tell the difference between broadening due to a wave and due to turbulence? It's it's hard to tell. Um, I mean, in the your experiment, could... you can pin down this. You measure the amplitude of the wave versus the background field that's much less than one. So if you would have a measure of tur the turbulent component in B versus the guiding B, you could probably tell the difference. I agree with lines, it's probably very different. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to measure magnetic fields in the corona. This is one of the things that, um, that Dekas is trying to do with all these uh, spectropolarimeters, is to measure magnetic fields in the corona. I'm not sure it will be, I mean, the methods have never been tried because um, it's, it's been an ongoing. It's one of the big problems in observational solar physics is to measure the coronal magnetic field. And maybe they'll do a good enough job that you can measure uh, magnetic field fluctuations. One thing that, that maybe is related is we've thought about trying to better quantify the shape of the spectral lines. So um, with the work that I've done so far, we've been using, um, like on Hinode, the instrumental broadening, the diffraction in the instrument, is of the same order as the uh, thermal and non-thermal broadening. With DKIST, partially because it has very good resolution and huge spectrometers, and also uh, partially because it's looking in the infrared where the lines are much broader to begin with, the spectral resolution is much smaller than the expected line widths. Um, so we'll be able to measure in more detail the shape of the lines. There are indications now, uh, we've, we've done some projects on looking at the shape of the lines, that, that they're not Gaussian, that they, they have broader tails uh, and they might be more um, consistent with like a kappa distribution. And then the question is, is this due to the, to the distribution of the ion, uh, the, the, the microscopic distribution of the ions, or due to turbulence? So turbulence, you expect to get some kind of a power law velocity distribution, which would create broad tails. Uh, so if we can measure several ions from different elements uh, so that they have different masses, so that we can separate out what's due to fluid motions and what's due to the microscopic motions of, of each individual ion species, we might be able to quantify turbulence in this way by, by looking at how the shape of the line varies among the different species. So another another DKS project on that. We'll, we'll have to see if it works. So, uh, to go back to uh, the beginning of your talk, you were looking at the fluctuations in terms of the the variance, the fluctuations in the intensity. Yeah. And you got measurements of what effectively is sort of the two-point function, right? Because it's a, it's the RMS fluctuations of functional height. Right. I wonder if you have the information to look at effectively higher point statistics on. Um, you know, you've got when you get to the level of ten or twenty point percent fluctuations, I suspect that the fluctuations could be non-Gaussian, and in some ways, you know, I can write that say now look at delta I cubed measure delta I, you know. Go look at higher moments, and in some ways, I think that may help distinguish between mode-mode coupling, which is only important, you know, which will dominate in the weak regime, and going to the fully nonlinear limit where you have, you know, dissipation on uh, in filaments and things like that sheets. So you're talking about look at the look at the statistical distribution of the fluctuations as a function. Yep. Yeah, I'll look at Michael, I have a question for you. So you talk about this mechanism of heating, and they all rely ultimately on the existence of turbulence and some level of magnetism. So these are probably very common features of stellar surfaces. And so I was wondering if you thought about um, extension of this idea of heating coronas around stars to other stellar types and what that will imply for, uh, for observation, for example, of uh, higher energy emission from stars. Yeah, so um, I haven't really done anything on other stars. 
I think that there are Sun is that there are many different things that can lead to the heating of the corona. And it is probably true of other stars as well. So I wonder to what extent the sun is like other stars. We I should be like some of them, but you know, I, you're, my understanding is that you know, for a while people have thought that the sun was typical, and now it seems like it's atypical in some ways in terms of the way it, um, it's a uh, solar cycle and things like this. So. So maybe it's alpine waves for the sun in certain stars, and maybe it's nano flares or reconnection for other stars. Um, I think it would be interesting to, to try to figure out what is the regime of other stars that are similar enough to the sun where the same mechanisms can apply. Um, I'd be interested in learning more about what kinds of observations you can make of other stars to try to constrain these parameters. I understand there's people who are trying to find to look at astrospheres. I don't think that's quite high enough resolution to, to really look at things. I mean, you have, you, you've got some kind of for other stars. From what I know, you have like the total X-ray flux or something like that, and that's that's the level of information we're at. And I don't know if that's enough constraint to say how many things. Maybe if you have some model for what the star looks like, you could predict how many alpha waves, and then you could say whether it's relevant or not. Anyway, I'm, I'm making things up because, uh, but it would be interesting to talk about. Any more questions? Okay. If not, uh, then uh, Michael again. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining. A lot of claps from, from Zoom. So, yeah. Thank you, everyone.